Warning, some contents may be disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Last night, someone took their own life in our township. We discovered this when we woke up today to a commotion in the streets outside our home. Like most countries in the world, the Philippines is under lockdown. It's much stricter here in the capital, Manila, so we're all pretty much at home most of the time anyway. There were police and media vans everywhere, their cars clogging up the street, and they themselves were congregated right outside Mrs. Bautista's gate, which was just a few houses removed from ours. A crowd had already gathered at the edge of the police cordon that was hastily put up, and our neighbors were at Twitter with subdued but nonetheless animated conversation. It was a funny sight, given that social distancing here was strictly enforced. At least, most of them were wearing masks. And after taking time to put on my own mask and face shield, and assuring my dad and my wife that I'll get to the bottom of things, I made my way to the gathered crowd. I wasn't really relishing squeezing through them to find out what was what, but curiosity propelled me forward. I had just got into the head of the pack when they started rolling out a body bag through the gate and hastily loading it up to the back of a white truck of the kind normally used for deliveries here in our country. A hush fell over everyone as this was happening. Even I just stared at the whole spectacle in silence. And when they slammed the door shut, it seemed to jolt everyone awake. The gathered crowd erupted into a roar of speculation, terrified and nervous assertions, but mostly just asking, What the hell happened? Mrs. Bautista was one of the longest-staying residents of our little town deep within Manila. She was one of the nicest too, always willing to help anyone out who asked her. She was close friends with my grandmother and visited often. And when I was younger, she used to pinch my cheeks until they hurt. Sa aming investigasyon, mukhang ang cause of death ay nagpakamatay yung matanda. Which means, from our investigation, it appears the old lady has committed suicide, said the officer who walked over to us. Papaano nagpakamatay? Ang bait-bait niya. Mukha naman siyang masaya. Translated as, what do you mean she killed herself? She's a good person and she seemed really happy. Asked my aunt Rosie. She lived across from us and was usually quiet. The fear was evident in her face, and when she was done with her question, her eyes met mine, and you could see the panic building. The answer to her question was not forthcoming. The officer who served as spokesperson shifted gears and started shouting for us to clear the way for the cat of her truck to pass through, followed by the other cop cars, and he himself embarked and left followed all the way by pleading people, shouting their questions and demands for answers. We all lingered in the area for a bit, casting nervous glances toward Mrs. Bautista's gate, which was now sealed shut by a crime scene tape, and crudely barricaded with sawhorses emblazoned with Philippine National Police. Everyone started slowly moving back towards their homes, when people realized that there were going to be no clear definite answers to their questions. I was about to leave myself as my wife was waving for me, frantically, from our open gate, when Aunt Rose grabbed my arm. As I turned to face her, she shushed me and drew me closer to a whisper. She said, Pinalatando siya. She was skinned. What? That was the only thing that I could muster in response. A chill running through my skin and the hair standing on the back of my neck. Last night, her, Mrs. Bautista's neighbor, 
heard crying and pleading coming from that house. Answered Aunt Rose, pointing to the barricaded gate with her pursed lips, as is common in our country. I was really taken to a bag to answer, so instead followed her pointing with my eyes. Mrs. Bautista was begging someone not to hurt her. She was also praying. Did the police say anything about who did it? Wag ka nang maingay. Don't be noisy. She admonished, before glancing around her as if to check if anyone was eavesdropping. The police said that her body was found without its skin, crumpled in a corner of her bedroom. They believe it was suicide just because the entire house was completely sealed shut. All the doors and windows were locked from the inside. She paused for a moment to pull out a cigarette from her pocket. I had known her to have kicked that habit out for many years now, but I didn't say a word. I acquit myself, but what Aunt Rose said next made me wish I hadn't. Ang nakakatakot, hindi man lang nila mahanap yung balat. Which means, what's scary is that they didn't find her skin. I told my dad and wife everything I knew, and it sent them in quite the panic. My dad started urging us to pray more. We're a Catholic country, though my wife and I are atheist, and my wife hopped in a video call with her family in the province. The lockdown has been in effect for a month and a half already, and she hasn't been able to go home to visit since then. I'm sure the horror of this morning didn't help at all with her missing them. I could hear her being comforted by her dad in our bedroom, so my dad and I set about to inspect our house. We were scared as hell and we wanted to be sure that we would be secure by the time night fell. Our house, to be entirely fair, is pretty secure. Built in the 70s, it featured grills on all windows and as was common in the Philippines during that era. Our back door, which opened up into the garage and laundry area, had a huge and heavy metal affair that had to be locked with a key the size of a finger. We spent a good part of an hour going over the entire house. Maybe a part of us was half expecting to find some hidden monster or demon waiting to pounce. And when we were done, it was about lunchtime and my wife stepped out of our room, looking much more comforted. I walked over and gave her a hug, and I told her that it was going to be alright. She nodded silently, and we just found comfort in each other's arms, until she patted me on the back and said that she would prepare lunch. The rest of the day proceeded with some semblance of normalcy. I went to do my job as a writer for a comms company in the UK and my wife settled back into studying for law school. My dad just went back to lie on his favorite couch and spent the day playing his word games on the smartphone. And deep into the afternoon, one could almost imagine the horrors of the morning, a far off and distant thing. The fear only started to creep in again as the sky started to darken with the impending night. You could hear people on the streets rushing to get home, and by the time night had fully set in, a loaded silence descended upon our town. My wife herself started to draw the curtains about the house. She normally argued with me to keep them open, hot as it is in our country at this time of the year, and as she did that, I started locking the house down. I started with a heavy door out in the back and made my way through each room and ended with the front door, which I promptly triple bolted. It was at this point that my dog, normally quiet but highly active, started to whimper and whine. As I leaned in to pet her, she bolted for our bedroom where she normally spent the night and crawled under the bed like the devil was after her. This gave us pause to listen but there really was nothing but silence as we settled for dinner. Mrs. Bautista in our little town 
It's called Nayong Kanluran, made the national news that night. News outlets quickly tagged it as the most shocking crime of the decade. Experts were phoning in to give their two cents worth. One said it could be a crime of passion. Another that it was an angry relative. Yet, another claimed that it was possibly a serial killer. The last one is funny given how utterly rare it is to have a serial killer in the Philippines. By my recollection, only one has ever been recorded in our history. What all these experts and even the chief of police in our city fail to answer is the question of how a killer got in with a home thoroughly locked down. If that wasn't creepy enough, the reports also stated that the crime scene was relatively bloodless. We could see that for ourselves as many cut to the scenes in Mrs. Bautista's bedroom. Beyond her body, which was thankfully blurred out heavily to allow us to keep our dinners, the room was absolutely spotless. We could tell that what happened to her was horrific. However, even through the blur, you could only make our reds and blacks exclusively. And while you couldn't see the full thing, it got to my wife who promptly ran to the bathroom and vomited out all of her dinner. We stopped eating after that. We went to bed relatively early given the horror of the situation we were in. And I only woke up hours later because our dog, Washi, was running about our bedroom barking furiously. When my wife woke up shortly after me, she sat up and opened the lamp beside our bed. We both stared at Washi for a bit, not having shaken off the stupor of sleep. It took a while for reality to set in, and my wife was the first to register clear panic. You see, we're kind of used to our dog doing this. Ever since we let her sleep with us a few months ago, there would be nights where she'd excitedly run around the room, sniffing and barking at windows, the walls, the floor, the door, in frenetic succession. We always just brushed it off as mice that she smells or hears in our walls and about the house. It's really that old. But tonight, of course, was different. We shushed her, a futile effort, and sat silently, trying to hear for whatever was bothering her. Nothing, apart from Washi going apeshit, that night seemed quiet. I got up as I usually did when this happened, with the intention of letting Washi out of the room. It was a cycle, really. We'd let her out, she'd do the same thing around the house, barking and sniffing, before begging to be let into our bedroom, and quietly settling down for sleep. But this night was different in light of this morning's events. For one, she eventually settled to barking and growling at our bedroom door. This was something she had never done before, and almost instinctively, I grabbed the aluminum bat that I kept in the room for protection and quietly made my way to the door. As I grabbed the knob, I looked back at my wife who seemed to be barely keeping herself together, and with a deep breath, I gripped the knob and the bat in my hands tighter and pulled the door open, bat drawn high up and body tense to strike. But there was nothing there but our darkened living room. Even my dog fell silent then. Well, not so silent. She was whimpering in fear, her body as flat to the floor as she could manage, and her tail firmly tucked beneath her trembling form. Furtively, I stepped outside, inching my way on near tiptoes towards the living room light switch. With every step I took, my dog withdrew slowly until she was close to our bed near the windows. By the time that I flipped on the light switch, she hopped on the bed and cuddled close and tight with my wife. There was nothing there. I did a cursory walkthrough of my home, with my bat still in my hands, checking every door, window, and a shadowed corner of our home. 
It was when I reached the front door to check on the deadbolts that I finally heard it. It sounded like the skittering of rats. But I instinctively knew it wasn't rats. The sound was much louder in volume, but quiet in intensity if that makes sense. My dog heard it too, and I imagine in greater detail as she buried her head in my wife's arms. My wife couldn't seem to hear it, our air conditioning unit droned pretty loud, so she wordlessly mouthed, Ano yun? What is it? I shrugged my shoulders and started to turn my head about, trying to find the source of the sound, though it would flare up every few moments. Where it was coming from eluded me for quite some time, until I realized that it was coming from the street outside. I made my way to the receiving room that separated our area of the home from the front door. The door to access that room had a bell attached, the kind to tell you that someone had come in. My grandmother and her caregiver lived in another part of our home. Because of this, I had to open that door very slowly. All the while, the skittering would come and go and burst. By the time that I had made it into the front door, it was silent once more. It stayed quiet for a while. I had already confirmed that the front door was firmly shut and bolted, but I felt drawn to the large bay window beside it and peeked outside. Our front gate was wide open. Well, this isn't a new thing. My cousin whose family lived in the area of the house below us occasionally forgot to close the gate when she left for her graveyard shift job at a local call center. I was about to storm out, irritated, to close and secure it, when I finally saw it. It entered my field of view in the split second that I was slowly pulling my gaze from the window. It looked like a terribly tall, desiccated corpse standing on all fours. Framed by our open gate, I got a full view of the thing from the side. Its skin was sickly brown and clung to its very thin, long and slender bones. It was almost leathery and in some sections somewhat transparent. The effect was most horrific on its head, which looked like a human skull. There were copses of thin white hair all about its crown, and where its eyes and nose should have been were just empty recesses. As it waved its head about, seemingly sniffing the air, if that were even possible, its mouth clicked open and shut. It had rows of teeth sharpened to points and seemed to gasp desperately for air each time its mouth drew open. Really, it looked for all the world to be a skinny, horrible corpse, but for the long, sharp claws where its hands and fingers should have been. I was stunned and couldn't move. Thankfully, that I hadn't thought to turn on the lights in the room that I was in. I stared at it for what seemed like hours, until I heard a click, click, the distance that snapped me awake. It noticed it too and bounded out of sight, tap, 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 skittering off to the distance until the night fell still once again. My wife eventually made her way to me and hugged me, frantically asking me if I was alright. It was then that I noticed that I was drenched in a cold sweat and out of myself for a time. Eventually I drew her into a hug and told her that I was okay. Sure, I was far from okay, I was terrified, but I didn't want to panic her more than she already was. She kept asking me what happened and each time I told her that nothing was the matter. I repeated this so many times, I almost believed it. We eventually made our way back to our bedroom, where Washi, my dog, greeted me with her usual excitement, jumping all about me trying to lick my face. She was so excited, she even eventually slipped and fell on her back. This made my wife and I laugh hysterically, Sorry, Washi. 
and seemed to break the gloom that had unknowingly descended on our home. My wife is asleep beside me now, with our dog curled at her feet. They look so peaceful and normal. Everything kind of feels normal. Until I close my eyes and see it again. Jesus, what was that thing? Actually, the more important question for me is, how the hell do I protect my family? A very good friend of mine invited a few friends and me over to see his hometown in the Philippines. He was visiting his relatives for a few days, but he wanted to bring us along because he hasn't been back there since he was seven, and he was afraid that he might feel a bit alienated at first. We were hesitant to agree due to the cost of the trip and how rude it would be to intervene in a family reunion. But my friend explained that Filipinos really enjoy the company and might even let us stay in one of their houses. To top it off, he showed us pictures of a stunning white sandy beach right next to his hometown. And at this point, the offer was hard to decline. We went there a few weeks ago and just got back, and what I experience still haunts me, even though we have returned. I was a bit of a skeptic, and I would have probably been the last of my friends to believe old folklore, but it seems the locals provided better explanations than I could at those moments. For our first few days there, we were in Manila, the capital, and these days were some of the most normal. The cities there were pretty modernized, and the locals spoke decent English, so we didn't feel that set apart. We spent these first few days tasting the food and getting to know the culture. They were friendly people, but they weren't very chatty. By our fourth day, it was time to go to our friend's place, which was a long way from Manila, in a province called Bicol. We traveled by car, which nearly took us half the day, and the further we went, the more rural the places looked. Vast roads turned into rice paddies, and buildings became huts and old wooden houses. The only vehicles on the road were rusty pickup trucks, pedicabs, and jeepneys, and our rented Toyota Vias stuck out like a sore thumb. We stayed there for around 12 days, and here were some of our downright creepy experiences. Day 1 we arrived at my friend's place, and his family welcomed us with open arms. There was a simple party with enough food to feed a whole neighborhood, karaoke, which was a Filipino staple, and also beer. It was all fun and everyone was laughing and singing, until it started to get dark. And this was when it started to get strange. Immediately after the sun went down at around 6 p.m., they started cleaning up and the guests started to leave. It was strange because it was so early and everyone still looked as if they were having fun. I asked my friend why the party was over so soon and he just said that people in these parts hit the sack earlier. And they say it's not safe to go out at night. The thought of this place not being safe really confused me since the town was small and very rural so criminals didn't seem like an issue. But I shrugged it off and we slept in an extra room in my friend's house. Day 2 My friend brought us to his cousin's house down the street. He was close to her as a kid and really wanted to pay her a visit. She was five months pregnant and he couldn't wait to see her. But when we got to the house, there were a few men boarding up the windows. My friend yelled at the man in Filipino, I couldn't understand it, and one of the men yelled back. My friend explained to us that he was her husband and that we could go right in. We climbed the steps to the door, which were strangely sprinkled with salt, and turned the doorknob, 
which hung a necklace of garlic. We apprehensively went into the house, and I could see his cousin sitting in a rocking chair, her belly slightly bloated. The two cousins chatted for a bit until the strange modifications to the house were mentioned. We were all curious, and she could see that. She spoke in rough English for all of us to understand, and the words she managed to say were, I'm afraid of the tick tick. My friend scoffed after that statement, at which we all looked at them in confusion. My friend explained that the tick tick was an old Filipino legend of a humanoid monster with a long tongue, which it used to suck out fetuses from the mother's womb. Three things deterred the tick tick and other Filipino monsters. Salt, garlic, and anything blessed by a priest. And like my friend, I didn't think anything of it, but the fact that the locals would go through all this trouble meant that there must be something more to it. We went on our way and said goodbye to my friend's cousin, but that wasn't the last we were to see of her. Day 4 We were starting to get bored, so we decided to go to the beach. It was beautiful, with crystal clear waters and a smooth white sand. The only thing strange was that there was nobody out there swimming, and everyone stayed well away from the water's edge. And when we tried to get into the water, a fisherman went over to us and shouted at us to stay away. My friend went over to talk to him, and a fisherman told him that a little boy went swimming in these waters the other day and went missing. When the boy's friends were questioned, they told the parents that he was pulled down into the water and dragged by the ocean. There were some who speculated that it was the work of a shokoi, a sea monster who dragged swimmers into the deep water to feast on their flesh. This was the second time a monster was mentioned to us during our stay. Though we didn't necessarily believe him at that time, we still didn't swim as respects to the missing boy. That night, we ran a little late getting back to the house, and as we rode a jeepney, the sun went down and it was pitch black aside from the headlights made by our vehicle. We passed by a man walking alone beside the road, and when he saw us, he raised his hand gesturing us to stop, but the jeepney driver kept going and ignored the man. I told my friend to ask the driver why he ignored the potential passenger, and my friend told me that the driver didn't pick up people this late, and that the driver feared that they might not even be people at all. Day 5 We woke up that day, and we were surprised to see that none of our stuff was as we left them when we fell asleep. Our bags were wide open, and all the clothes were thrown around the room. The pillows were on the floor, and the shoes were on the bed, and the room was just in complete chaos. My cousin called for his grandfather, whom owned the house, to see the mess, and he looked around the room and chuckled. We asked him what he was laughing about, and he whispered something to my friend, who then translated his message. He told us that the children must have gotten into the room. It was strange, since we never saw any children in the house before. I asked the old man if they had kids in the house, and he managed to make out the words used to. And after this experience, I grew ever fearful of what this town had to hide and how much truth these legends had. Day 7 A couple of days ago, we learned that nobody went outside of their house at night in fear of some strange things. But it turns out that not everybody followed that rule. That morning, the whole town was distressed as the body of a teenage boy was found beside a clump of banana trees near a densely wooded forest. He had been impaled by a sharp piece of bamboo sticking out of the ground. He was supposedly with a girl that night, but no trace of her had been found. My friend had overheard some gossip from the townsfolk 
and explain what the locals thought had happened. It turns out, the two had been seeing each other behind their parents' back as teenagers too, and that these two teenagers weren't particularly superstitious. So they arranged meetups at night, despite the elders warning them of the dangers of going out after dark. It is said that a colony of Encantos, which are sort of like fairies, but a lot more sinister than those in the fairy tales, lived in those banana trees. The prince saw the young lady and wanted to take her as his bride. These creatures had the ability to control nature, so the prince made a bamboo grow out of the ground and stabbed the boy in the chest. He then took the girl away to the land of the Encantos, where she is forever trapped. And normally, I would just brush these stories off as nonsense, but after all that I've heard, I don't know what to believe. Day 9 We didn't do much that day because one of my friends caught a terrible fever. He was burning up and the nearest drugstore was miles away. Without our knowledge, my friend's grandfather called in a witch doctor, and from my first look at him, I knew he was nothing more than a quack. He was a frail old man who looked as if he needed the medical attention. And with him, he carried a basket of leaves, herbs, candles, and other junk. I didn't want him to touch my friend because I feared it would only make him worse, but the family insisted, and we let the doctor into the room. He felt my friend's forehead, and he asked him to take off his shirt. My friend was sweaty and pale as the quack rubbed a bunch of leaves on his back. The doctor faced the family and asked them for something. My friend ran over to stop them, but his family reassured him, and then he sat back down. I asked him what happened, and he said that a doctor asked for the juice of a one-day-old puppy. I was surprised and confused. I was unable to speak at the thought of it. And an hour later, a relative arrived with a bowl of slimy red liquid. The doctor grabbed it and mixed in some herb, which looked a bit like mint. He held it in front of my friend's mouth and made him drink it. I nearly barfed at the horrifying sight, but couldn't speak due to the utter shock. The doctor stood and left the room as did my friend's family. And when we were alone, we argued among ourselves on why we would let that nut even touch our friend. We stopped as our friend slowly sat up and looked at us with his normal reddish tan skin. He no longer felt warm, nor did he show any signs of ever being sick in the first place. The doctor cured him. I don't know how, but he did. Day 10 This was a Sunday, and when we woke up in the morning, my friend's family was already urging us to go to church. The church was Catholic and they kept the doors open to let the air in, which made sense in the warm climate. A few of my friends and I who weren't Catholic stayed outside while pretty much the rest of the town was in the church. It was about midway through the service when an old man arrived. He just stood outside, staring at us with a creepy grin. The townsfolk started to notice him and immediately gestured for us to go inside. We followed, and once we were through the door frame, the man's grin disappeared. Everyone was just staring at him, wondering what he would do next. And a few minutes later he left, and the mask continued as if nothing ever happened. We went over to our friend and asked who the hell that was, and he told us nobody knew. I asked why the whole town seemed afraid of him if they don't even know him. He simply replied, In such a small town, not knowing somebody is scary. I still had a lot of questions in my mind, but decided to keep them to myself. Who was that man? Why was he intently staring at us, and why did he not follow us into the church? Day 11 
We were woken up by the sounds of screaming coming from a few houses away. It was early around 3 a.m., and the whole town ran out of their houses to see the commotion. It came from the house of my friend's cousin. We ran over there, still in my pajamas, to see a decently large crowd gathered in front of their house. The husband was climbing down the steps, frantically shouting something in Filipino. My friend looked over at my other friend and grabbed her shoulders. He told her that they needed medical attention. She nodded and walked over to the frightened man, with the rest of us following closely behind. She tells the man that she's a paramedic, and he grabs her hands, tears flowing down his face and yells, Salamat! Which is one word I actually know. It meant thank you. He leads her inside the house and we quickly follow. The woman was sitting on the rocking chair, her face wet from tears and sweat, my friend does a quick checkup of her, feeling her belly and asking her questions, while my other friend translates. And after a moment, my paramedic friend looked up at us, horrified. Her baby is gone, she said. The rest of us were just in shock. She asked the couple if they had had a miscarriage, and they denied. She told us that there were fresh puncture wounds on her belly button as if someone poked a large syringe through it. This puzzled us, as there was no way an intruder could have gotten into the house since they boarded up all the windows, and the couple said that they had locked the door. It started to rain outside, and I noticed the ceiling started to leak. I looked up and saw that there was a golf ball-sized hole in the roof, and I asked the couple about the hole, and at first, they seemed confused, like they didn't know that they had a very noticeable hole in their ceiling. When the woman saw it, she got down on her knees and cried, and she kept shouting words in Filipino, constantly yelling out dick dick, which was the only word I understood. When the sun rose, my paramedic friend and Filipino friend stayed in the house while the rest of us left. I could never forget what had transpired in that house. Day 12 This was the day we left, and to be honest, I was relieved, but I was also frustrated. We didn't leave with happy memories or refreshed spirits. Instead, we were left with questions about the town where my friend had spent his childhood. But perhaps, the biggest question that bothered me as if there were any other towns like this in the Philippines, or if all of them were just like this town. I guess these questions won't be answered now, and I don't know if I'm ever coming back. We left the town, and as our car drove away, we looked back to see all of the locals waving their hands in goodbye. They looked as if they were relieved that we have left. And here are the top comments for my last video. And here's the riddle for this video. The year of the rat, the dog, or the boar. On this holiday, you'll find dragons, lanterns, and so much more. What is it? Hello everyone, it's your creepy sister here. Thank you so much for watching the video. I really appreciate each and every one of you. But I would also like to thank my amazing patrons, my top tippers, and my dearest channel members. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it with all of my heart. If you want to support the channel further, you could also choose to become a patron a tipper, or a channel member. But remember, it's appreciated, but never a requirement. I would also like to announce that we have merch now. The link is in the description of the video, along with all my other social media links, like my Discord server, Twitter, Instagram, and others. You can connect with me and send your stories there. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't yet, and comments are highly appreciated.
And remember, your fear feeds me.